just from experience, we can get more out of people who work virtually in a, in a virtual setting if we, if we take care of them. And, and sometimes that becomes a little bit of a challenge, right? But I think for the most part, finding the right people that can work virtually uh, empowers them and gives them the ability to outperform those people that are working in a, a building setting. the management and transparency is what's very important. So once you submit a referral, you're going to have your own home advantage account and it's going to tell you where everything sits. So if you have 10 referrals that you've sent into the network, it's going to give you all 10 referrals. It's going to tell you every milestone that that client is sitting in, whether they're touring homes, whether they're an escrow. And you now can manage through the home advantage application as far as what your pipeline looks like for the referrals that you've sent. And so it's pretty sophisticated uh, and it's, it's all click of a button, guys. Welcome to this. We've got Gustavo, Gustavo Munoz Castro. Uh, he's, he's the one that created Power Eye is Safe. You're wondering who this amazing guy is. Great background, by the way. He used to work at Microsoft. He's currently, you're still in real estate where you yeah. have your license, right? So still, 100%. And anyone wants to buy it, buy yourself something, preferably Mexico. That's where I spend most of my time now. I'll hook you up. I'll hook you up. I love that. Uh, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to ask for your help. All right. So after, after, yeah, remind me. No worries. Well, Let's then. talk about ISAs because you've got this amazing outline here. Source, hire, and manage ISAs to add leverage to your business. You where go. do you want to start, buddy? So, you know, uh, I want to start. So thanks for the intro. Appreciate that, Tristan. So, you know, for, I was thinking about this, right? We're talking about, you know, uh, hiring, training, managing virtual ISAs, virtual professionals in our teams. We are, you and I are probably some of the most qualified people to do this, uh, you know, in the whole, at least the U.S. Let's, let's limit it, right? Maybe not the whole world, maybe not. But probably for real estate in the U.S., probably are some of the best people to talk about this because we've done this, you know, a hundred times. Tristan, how many virtual, not just I say, but virtual people do you have in your co or your companies? I don't know how many we're talking about. How many virtual teammates do you have right now? Uh, 52. I think we have 50. 52. That's awesome, right? So, 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 you know, at the very least, you've done this 52 times. Probably hundreds, if not thousands of times to get yeah. to this point, right? But you've done it 50 times. I have about 100, you know, people, you know, on staff with my company helping me out doing this. And so, so, so we've done this at a really high level. We've really maximized this model, right? The, the virtual model. But Tristan, what, what, what is it about this virtual model that is really, I mean, you've, 50 people is amazing, right? Like that's like a massive team. What, what, what is attracting you to this model? Why, why leverage it to that extent? You don't have to limit yourself to finding talent in a local area. And, and I think, obviously, through COVID, uh, we experienced the ability to hire from anywhere a lot more. It opened really the minds of people. It's like, wait a second, we can hire from Hold anywhere. On. Yes. Right? And I, 100%. Think, I think those people, even though we're seeing people come back to, to work, in an actual building, right? Yeah. We still have a whole mess load of people that are working virtually. And I think just from experience, we can get more out of people who work virtually in a, in a virtual setting if we, if we take care of them. And, and sometimes that becomes a little bit of a challenge, right? But I think for the most part, Finding the right people that can work virtually uh, empowers them and gives them the ability to outperform those people that are working in a, a building setting. I, I agree with you, man. And there's a, there's a big debate going on in, in the in the U.S. and probably all, all over the world about this on-premise versus virtual model. It, it's massive. It's huge. I, yeah. I agree with you, Tristan. I think COVID exposed us in the sense that it really questioned what could be done in-house you know, on-premise, what could be done virtually. I think it is a lot of these roles realize, you know what? They can be done to a high, at a high level, very high level 
virtually. A lot of roles we never considered. I don't think we had thought about that, right? And I think, but you know, you mentioned something really interesting. If we take care of people the right way, I think virtual work has also exposed us to the need to keep people engaged more. Because when you're in the office next to them, I think you kind of get a pass on that, right? You, I mean, yeah. you're right there. I mean, you're, you're engaged. You're, you're, you're right there. You, you don't, the engagement level, I think, would be different when you're in-house. When mm-hmm. you're virtual, you have to be more purposeful about it. You have to be a little bit more intentional about keeping you know. people engaged in the team and the mission, what you're doing. So, and, and I want to talk about that stuff too. But anyways, that, that's we're setting the table for this discussion. This is why this is such a, a, a huge model. And I agree with everything you're saying, Tristan. The talent pool, the flexibility, the kind of people you can get um, is just completely different when you open up to the virtual uh, work model. And I, so funny story, I just came back from being in a week in Cancun. Love it. Love Mexico. Um, and let me tell you, right, talking about people, you know, coming back to work, all of Cancun was shut down for the better part of a year. OK, Whoa. the whole area, there was nothing going on uh, in 2020 into 2021. Nothing. They haven't recovered yet fully. Right. Because a lot of those folks and I'm telling you, as someone who hired a lot of those people, right, native English speakers, great with people. They, they didn't have work for a year. A lot of them discovered it remote work. A lot of them did. And a lot of them have not gone back. They've not come back. And guess no. what? I'm not going to knock Cancun. But because every resort, every a lot of the service industry, hospitality is the same. They're struggling, right? They haven't recovered fully with those fully trained and awesome people. And they've not come back. Not everyone went back. Not everyone's gone back because they found opportunities to work from home. And they're like, man, I can be, I can go back to my like hometown. I can work from my, the comfort of my own home, be with my family more. So there's a lot of advantages that I see, um, you know, in it. But but today we're talking about how to plug into this system of virtual, virtual roles, specifically ISAs, how to find them, how to hire them, how to onboard and manage them to really add a ton of leverage to your business, right? So um, let's, let's jump into it, jump right into it. We already talked about myself. Um, what are we going to cover here? We're going to cover a lot of stuff, right? How to get started with a virtual ISA to do like a great job for you, how to source those candidates, the interview process, the onboarding and training process. And then we're going to talk a little bit about bonuses and compensation. So that always gets asked a lot, but but I, I'm, I'm leaving it that towards the end because this other stuff is, 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 is even more important, right? Because yeah, you, you the market sets the rate. So let's talk about that. The market sets the rate. This other stuff is what you bring to the table, okay? So I'm gonna jump right into this. And Tristan, you're gonna be the customer advocate here. If people have questions, stop me, let me know. Uh, Marty, you wanna drill more now? Are we, we already have a question for you. Go Ray for Ray Pearson, he says, I'm waiting, on, I'm waiting to onboard. Can I get a free dialer? How does that work? Oh yeah, we have a great, so so Ray, so anyone attending uh, uh, today, you guys get a free promo. If you sign up with us, Ray, you're already signed up, right? So so yes, the answer is yes. Tell them Gus said yes to the, to the free dialer for a year. Uh, we have a special offer going on for folks to sign up, uh, uh, you know, towards the end of the month. Ray, uh, 100% yes. So tell them, Gus said so. Why? Because Gus said so, that's why. So right. there you go. Every, everybody else, if you signed up, right, from here to the end of the month, uh, you get that free promo, right? So there you go, awesome. Let's jump right into it. So there we go. Okay, so this is this is the first thing you have to tackle when hiring uh, uh, an ISA, right? Actually, this doesn't matter whether it's virtual or not. This is actually a little bit more, you know, but fundamental than that. What's your ISA going to do for you? It sounds like a really kind of a silly question. Tristan, you would be surprised how many people have not really thought through this process yet. This is the first question we want our, our clients to answer yeah. before they start interviewing anybody. They're not even, we're not even in the interview stage. We've got to sit down with them and walk through this process. And this is going to be a five minute conversation. If they've already thought through it, they have a process in place. They know what their ISA want, want them to do. But, but, but a lot of folks have not thought through this, especially if it's your first ISA that you're hiring. And that's what this webinar is geared towards. You haven't done this yet, probably, right? So this is what you have to do. You have to think through what they're going to do. Okay. Like, you know, and if you want to, you know, we just did a webinar right recently. Three ways an ISA can make you 100,000. Check that out. That's last month. You just check out that webinar. It's a really good one. It's on the LCA YouTube channel. Check it out because I'm going to, I give you some ideas on what an ISA can do for you. Check that out. But your ISA is going to need a really basic job description. Okay. And what are their goals? What are their goals? Right. And I'm going to give you two really simple examples. What I mean is your, is the job of your ISA 
to call your CR, all the leads that are in your CRM, respond to those new inbound leads, and set appointments and live transfers. Okay. It says that's what I mean by job description. I don't mean like three paragraphs about, you know, how much they're going to love your team and life and not. I mean like that level of description. Is it is it clear when you when, when things are clear and they're well understood, you can simplify. What I simplify and describe what the role of your ISA is. Another example, okay, the job of my ISA is to circle prospect around all of my listings and all of my buyers and all of my pendings and all of my, you know, just sold, right? That's their job. The circle prospect around every single house I like and want to get more clients from and generate more seller leads for the team. That's what I mean. What's their goal? To generate more seller leads in your pipeline. That's their goal. That's what they want, right? And they're going to do it by doing a ton of circle prospecting. So that so, so when, when, when clients first get onboarded to Power ISA, that's the first conversation we have with them. We want to make sure that the, the, the job description for the ISA is clear. Do you understand? And I don't mean that they only have to do one activity on your team. That, that doesn't really happen. ISAs do multiple activities. Yep. But do we know what the priority is? Okay. Do we know what the priority is? And it's usually in one of those two buckets. They're either calling and converting these online leads that people are buying, or they're doing the outbound prospecting to generate those, those, those seller leads, right? That's a basic thing. So for example, Tristan, when Tristan came to us, you know, Tristan, I think, I, and I, 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 I don't, I'm going to mess this up, but there was thousands, if not tens of thousands of leads in your database uh, uh, for, for one of your teams. And it was like, yeah, we need to get more out of that. Like we need to get like a better return because uh, that money had already been spent, right? I mean, you had thousands of leads in the database. So you guys, again, you had to scale where there was a specific role you wanted to fill. Uh, we need an ISA to call the leads that are already in the database. They're already there. Follow up and nurture those folks until they're ready to talk to the agent, right? So yeah. that's a great job description, right? It's very straightforward. Call that's pretty, people. That's already. pretty easy. And you guys do a great job of that because- at that point, you're just nurturing my database and helping us execute at a higher level. It's like, oh, there's a hand raiser, right? Like that. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And for a lot of these leads, online leads in particular, right? Some of them are going to convert off the bat. Yeah, some of them will, for sure, no doubt. Everyone else, it's that follow-up game. Everybody else, everybody else. And if you're just relying on that low-hanging fruit, those in immediate hand raisers, I mean, you're going to get some deals but the ROI is just not going to be there. I can tell you this. This is not 2013 anymore, right? This is 2023. You gotta, you gotta work these leads. You really gotta work them, and you got to really get that conversion rate, you know, maximized. So you gotta, gotta think through this process. Okay, what is your ISA going to do? Define it. And the way we love to see this is an SOP. Okay, SOP, right? Standard operating procedure, statement of process, whatever you call it. SOP is a document that has one through end of what your ISA is supposed to do, right? And this is such an important piece, Tristan, that in our latest version of our Build Your ISA service, we include like examples now. Like, hey, this is exactly what it should look like. Like, like we include like a really short version where it's very simplified, and we include the long version in case you have a little bit more of a complex task, right? So this is exactly what it should look like when you're talking about an SOP. Because sometimes SOP, people, I mean, it can, it can mean you ask two agents what they think an SOP is, and you get five answers, right? Well, so we, we kind of take the guesswork out of it because it's a really important thing and it helps in every other step of the process. A lot of problems with onboarding training and getting results from your ISA can be traced back to this. What is it? What's their job? What's their goal? And then everything else can come from that, okay? Really, because if your job, if you hire an ISA just to get more deals, well, I mean, yeah, that's kind of kind of a goal, but but that's not specific enough. You got to get down to the details and understand what's the priority for your team and everything else emanates from that. Okay, great. Awesome. You know, and, and this is what I mentioned. You're probably going to fall into one of these two buckets, whole prospecting, inbound lead conversion. And we need to determine, okay, where are these leads coming from? Okay. Are they already in your database? Are you buying them from a, from a marketing agency, a lead generation company? You're generating them yourself. Great. How are we going to call them? Okay. What are you going to use to call them? And yes, yeah. we have a great promo going on. Get a free dollar for a year. Great. But if you don't have that, get one, right? Get one appropriate for the task. Because Mojo isn't for everything, right? 
Ring Central isn't for everything. I, I got to think through some of these activities. I have a Absolutely. question for you. Go for it. Um, Jose, what's up, Jose? I was told by one of your reps that ISAs make about 100 calls per uh, an eight-hour shift. Is that right? Or do you guys make more calls? Or what does that look like? I don't know. Oh, that's a great question. Because that's a really, really, really good question. Because the real answer is that it depends. I'm going to give you the engineering answer. It depends. I'd say an inbound focused ISA calling through a CRM, right? That's handling multiple kinds of activities. Because a lot of these CRMs, Tristan, they're designed to respond to text messages too. They're not just doing calling. The job of the ISA, I don't think is limited to calling. The job is to convert these leads in that inbound role. They're converting the leads. They're nurturing, following up, and converting leads. So when you're talking about phone calls, 100, it's, it's, it's on the low end for, for me. It's, it's on the lower end because they're probably doing other activities, right? Uh, in that in, in that, in that single line dialer, this is not like automation. This is not, no. This is like following up with leads that are in the CRM. That same role can probably do up to 250 per day if they're doing less of the texting, less of the after call activities, and they're focused more on the dialing, single line dialer, okay? One by one calling, probably do 100 all the way up to 250. Why the big variance? Because it depends what other activities are doing. It depends a lot on that, right? So I see a lot of teams that are loving the results of their ISAs, and they're doing 80 to 100 calls a day, right? Or 80 to 100 calls a day. Why so low? The goal isn't the call. The goal is the conversion. Like how many conversions are they getting on a daily basis? So I, that, that's, that's my rule of thumb. Single line dialing, lead management, kind of a role working in a CRM. 100, probably on the low end, up to 200, 250. If they're really booking it and getting through a lot of those dials, bam, bam, bam. Remember, the goal isn't the dial. Goals of conversion, but that's the first metric we want to look at. And we'll talk more about the metrics in, in the next one, uh, the next section of this presentation. I'll, I'll go more into that, okay? Yeah, I great. love it. Thanks, man. Uh, they, yeah, they, great. They, thank you, too. So thank you. Awesome. And you know, and, and the other thing you need, we talked about dialer, and you need a script, too. Okay, You need a script. If you don't oh, already yeah. have one, you need that in there, too, because all this stuff comes together. What's do their you, job? What's their goal? Do you provide the scripts or no? hundred percent. We write a script for pretty much any lead source that we've encountered. We have a script. A lot of times the teams bring their script. They go, no, no, guys, we want it done this way. No problem, right? The, our scripts are in place in case you don't like your script. A lot of people don't want the script. They don't think it's strong enough or they don't have one yet for that kind of lead source. We can provide that. No problem, right? And and one of our, you know, uh, a spoiler alert, we, get, we got one of our better scripts, inbound Facebook lead from the master, Barry Jenkins. We use Barry script, right? And his whole follow-up system, because that is one of the best in the business. So uh, there you go. So, and and, and you're going to flow and you're going to get that lead source. You're going to get that dialer. You're going to get that script because that has to make sense of what your ISA is going to do, okay? If you're focusing on one of those two buckets, you got to define each one of those for those activities. This is step number zero. We're not talking about candidates. We're not talking about compensation. No, no. What do you even want them to do? And how are your, what the tools that they need to be successful? Okay, great. Then we can move on to the next few steps. And the next step, now you've defined that. You define what, the what. Now we're going to define the who, okay? Who? Finding the best candidates, okay? How do you find those great candidates? Now, this is not easy. I don't really care where, you know, you're going to source these out, of it, whether it's U.S.-based, local, U.S.-based, virtual, is it Philippines-based? A lot of folks hire in the Philippines. Mexico, Colombia. Mexico and Colombia are the places we source our candidates from. You got to figure out where you want to sort these, source these candidates from. Because where you source them from matters a lot on how to source them and the compensation they're going to want, et cetera, right? So yeah. select the area first. And, and Tristan, you've done this. You, I, mean, I mean, on this call, we have one of your former ISAs, like Jake, right? You, still, you hired in-house uh, in California. I know you've hired virtually with the U.S. and you've hired worldwide, right? Yeah. Each one of those areas kind of has its own unique challenges, right? You got to prepare your offer, all right? You got to prepare an offer. U.S.-based, and, and Tristan, you know, let me know if this is cracking or not. U.S.-based in-house ISA is probably going to want an hourly rate of about 15 to up to 20, 25 bucks an hour. That's going to be a normal uh, compensation range that I see, you know, published online. 15, 25 bucks an hour plus bonuses. They might need to be licensed for that. 
Um, they're going to want some kind of benefits package, something like that, right? Philippines-based, right? And I don't want to knock the Filipinos. I mean, usually a little like way less than that. <laughs> like, bro, they're probably, you know, the, 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 on the lower end of the compensation scale. You can get ISAs of the Philippines for like three bucks an hour. I and mean, that's just, that's just the way that works. Um, and then bonuses are going to be very different uh, than, than folks based in the U.S. A lot of, a lot of ISAs based in the U.S., want to get compensated on commission, right? Like 5% of that commission, 10% of that commission. That's usually what a compensation package looks like for a US-based ISA. Outside of the US, very different. You can go fixed bonus compensation. It could be hundred bucks, you know, uh, uh, if they meet their goals, right? Doesn't and Rarely is that anywhere tied to a percentage of the commission. That's it. not just the, the market rate, the going rate, for these different areas. Obviously, if you hire outside the US, the compensation is very different. Philippines, three to four bucks an hour. Mexico and Colombia, five to six dollars an hour. I have a the question. Biggest, yeah, go for it. Joseph. On this, if you were to hire from the Philippines or Mexico or Colombia, why or or India, why would you go to each of those individually? What are their specialties? What do you think? So in, in my, that's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, you know, cause I think you and I have specialized in this now. Um, you know, my, my opinion is that Mexico and Colombia, since they're so close, you know, relatively as the rest of the world, so close to the U S they have a, a singular advantage, which is a lot of the folks in those countries, Mexico and Colombia are the lar- are the largest countries in the world that have native English speakers living in them. Okay, it's not a coincidence we recruit out of those places. They are the largest countries. Colombia is like 40 million. Mexico is 130 million. The largest countries in the world that have native English speakers living in them, which means they lived, worked, studied in the U.S., and they're now living in those countries. They are the largest by far. Right. There's a lot of countries in Central America and the Caribbean. And I mean, the largest I mean, volume. Right. They are the largest countries by far that have native English speakers living in them. And that's why we recruit there, because we want that native accent. And there's volume of folks that have that native accent in those countries. My opinion, Philippines and India, they, there's a lot of folks that speak really good English there, like, like fluent conversational English. The challenge is it's harder to find those that native accent. It's harder. It's way hard. It's India, especially because they're a native English speaking country. It's just they have an Indian accent or they have like a British Indian accent. There's no way around that. That's just the, the way it works in India. Philippines, a little bit of a different story, but they're, again, fluent conversational English. It just tends to be with more of an accent. It's the only difference. My opinion is that Philippines and India are better geared towards administrative work, marketing work, marketing kinds of tasks, right? Those are they're the best. You can get someone with a master's degree helping you do your tasks around the office, which I think is like freaking amazing, right? And that's a very different profile than the folks that are in Mexico and Colombia doing this job. They're not going to be have a master's degree. They're not going to be engineers, right? They're happy to do it. And in India and Philippines, you can. They've got college educated, advanced degrees, engineer, engineers doing this job. And when you're calling folks in sales, my, I'm, and I'm an engineer with a master's degree. Let me just tell you that. You don't need an engineering or a master's degree to do sales. Now, you need to be good on the phone, good attitude, great energy, and you want to learn, right? So that that's my that's a great question, Justin. That's my answer to that. I, I think like each that. country has its has different pros and cons, different benefits. Um, for callers, I don't think anything beats Mexico and Colombia. Not right now. Not, nothing that I've seen. Um, you know, as as a, as a collection. Okay. So yeah. So you want to prepare that offer and gear it towards the country you want to select, and. Here are my favorite sources to generate candidates and the folks that are doing this. So you, and so I, I envy a lot of the agents out there, right? You folks just have to find one great person to hire a lot of times. It's just one and you're, and you're great. You're good to go. We have to hire 10 to 15 people every single week, right? X amazing, 10 to 15 a week, every week for the next 52 weeks, right? And it's probably gonna get more because last year was like five to 10. Now it's 10 to 15 every single week because that's the level of talent we need to generate. Teams only have to find one person, okay? So a lot of times when people ask them, what's the best source? Get on Facebook, like get on Facebook, find a Facebook group of people that are calling for these industries, right? In these countries and ask for candidates. Cause you don't need, I get 200 applications a day. Dude, 
200 a day, 200 a day in Mexico and Colombia, right? And so you don't need to do that a lot of times, right? You know, we do that for our clients, but you don't need to do that 200 applications a day. You don't need that. You can go to one of these Facebook groups and start asking, right? And posting about your job description and the and the kind of role you want, right? Go for it, right? Yeah. Another great option, online job portals, okay? Indeed.com, online jobs. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's all these different online portals. They cost a little bit more money than posting on Facebook. They do. Um, but again, saves you time. It can be more efficient, right? An efficient use of that time. And then the mother of all of the, of the lead sources, and this is the one we rely on the most because it's the most scalable, are Facebook ads running in these countries. You can, you can target a country with a Facebook ad. It doesn't have to run just in your city. The whole country and run it, and, and again, you're publishing the job description, the job you want, and the kind of candidate you're looking for, okay? So Facebook ads are great if you generate 200 candidates a day. That's awesome. You probably don't need that, okay? You probably don't need that, but again, I put it out there because that's those are my favorite sources. Facebook groups, right. online job portals, Facebook, and we use all of them, but the Facebook ads is the steamroller of, of candidate generation, just so you folks know, okay? So these are these are the fa my favorite ways to generate candidates for this role, ISA role, native English speaking role, okay? Next one, it's not just about generating candidates. If it were problem solved, you need qualified candidates, okay? Qualified candidates need to have the right English level, right? They need to have the right compensation expectation, okay? Because you, you know, you might have people that are living in these countries. Hey, you know, I want to make 25 bucks an hour. Okay, great. It's good. This is not the offer for you, right? I might have a different offer. This is the offer that I want. And I want to make sure we're on the same page with that, right? And you want to make sure they have the right tools, internet speed, computer. They have to have a USB headset. Well, well no matter what country they're in, if they're, you know, if they're working virtually, they have to have the right tools to do the job. Right. And they have to have be theirs. They have to own this stuff. They can't like borrow it from a family member, from their girlfriend, from the library. You got to have it on their own. You got to make sure you have to go through, make sure every, these candidates are qualified candidates. But the biggest thing is the English level. Doesn't matter if they have the best computer, the best headset, if, if your English is not where you need to be. This is particularly for, for folks outside the US, this is a must. The number one thing we review. Do they have the right level of English that we need? Because otherwise, nothing else matters. It doesn't really matter, okay? So we recommend, whether it's Philippines or Mexico or any other of these countries outside the U.S., you can chat with them on, on a tool called WhatsApp, right? It's a tool. It's owned by Meta. It's a chat application. And the entire planet uses it, except the U.S., for whatever reason. And it's really useful because you can do voice chats and texting and messaging, all that really easily, okay? Rule of thumb. You you should not. So I, I would you so so Tristan back in the day I would do consulting and coaching on ISA teams for for all over the country, and the number one thing I noticed when I first got hired, which is why I stopped doing that, is that they they usually would have me train a candidate that wasn't that good. Okay, like the, usually the biggest issue that I found that I couldn't fix was they brought me in to train an ISA that wasn't doing a good job, and I realized they weren't a good fit for that role. And usually the way it went was this. Great. How many people did you interview for to get this candidate? Gus, I interviewed two people and I hired the best one. That was usually the story, yeah. right? That's true. I, it's true. I, 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 that. I talked to two people. I talked to three people and I hired the best one. I go, well, yeah, that's probably true. Then you didn't talk to enough people. Okay. You didn't talk to enough people. You have to rule of thumb. You got to talk to 10 qualified candidates to find one really good hire. Okay. Most agents, they really underperform here. They, they, they underestimate the amount of work it takes to find a solid person. They go, they interview two, and this is for any role. So, you know, rule, and like that rule of thumb applies to, to more than just ISA, but it's particularly true for ISA. 10 qualifying candidates to find one great hire, I think is a good rule of thumb. And if you're doing less than that, you're not doing enough. You didn't do it enough. You gotta do it the right way, okay? That's what we use. All right, great. We've got candidates in the pipeline now. They're qualified candidates. Well, what about the interview process? Great, right? Like I said, 10 to 1 is a good ratio. And you got to understand what the interview is really good for, okay? This is the next part of it. This is, we're getting into the weeds here. This is the new one. I like folks, it. Good. Right? This is, the interview is really good at judging their language skills, okay? Their accent. Do they, do, does this sound like someone you want calling for your team? The interview is great for that. Okay. 
It's great to see how they're going to react under stress. The interview is a high stress situation for them, right? They don't know who you are. They don't know what you're going to ask. They're just in there and let's see how they do. That's what the interview is really good for. To judge how someone reacts to that situation, okay? What the interview is not good at, right? And also, one more thing, cultural fit and team fit. That's usually a good, a good judge. Does this person sound like someone I want to even have on my team? The interview can be a good, a good indicator of that, right? What it is not great for, the interview is not great for, is does this person, if this person have the values, right? Do they have the work ethic and the grit, the grit? That's a, for, for folks of all of LCA, Dale Archdeacon, this is a, I got this from him, grit, okay? That is the most important thing for an ISA to have. And it is the hardest thing to find out, okay? Like there is no interview for grit. And, and Dale would, 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 would agree with me on that. There's no interview for grit. There is, get on the phone and let's see how you can do. That is how you find out if someone can do a job like this. And, and Tristan, I don't know if you follow Alex Hermosi, big internet entrepreneur out there. He's, he's an influencer on YouTube. I was, if he's yeah, not in real estate. No. What? Yeah, he's yeah, not I in real estate. Yeah, I know. He's, he's, oh yeah, he's a good guy. So he built an outbound calling team and he arrived at the same conclusion. They had they used to have this extensive interview process, multiple rounds of interviews, personality assessments, everything. And for this role, he, you see, he specifically had a cold calling team, but the same principle applies. He found that for that role, that lengthy interview process was essentially useless, okay? It was it was no better than putting people, in, in hiring 10 people at a time, getting them on the phone and figuring out who the best ones were. He found no difference in that. So he eliminated that lengthy interview process. They showed me to one interview and they got them in there and they would hire them. And they get in the, in the room, make calls, and then they'd really find out who the best person for that kind of a role is. I think that's, I think that's useful. That's a useful experience from a guy like that saying the be, this is, job is so hard that it's really difficult to find a great candidate just through the interview process. It's almost, it's almost next to, I don't want to say useless, but you get very limited information. You get the real information by getting them in the chair. Okay. That's really important to understand mm-hmm. as, as part of the, because for me, the final part of the interview, Tristan, is those first 30 days in the job. That's the final part you, of the interview. Gus, do you have them call a set of people before you hire them? We, we don't have them call a set of people before they're hired. Mm-hmm. We do role play, we, we work with them, right? That they can be you know, on the phone. And, and at this point, we only hire people that are from the call center industry. They've called before, right? Especially, this is so important when we're talking about cold calling. We only work with people that have done cold calling before because Got the it. biggest issue with cold calling is call reluctance, right? Yeah. That is a big one. one. It, it's, it's a massive one. It's a ma- it can affect anyone on the phone, but it's particularly true for cold calling, right? If someone has call reluctance, issue with call reluctance, it's a non-starter for us. You can't really do that. If you don't know what you're getting into with cold calling, we don't even want to talk to you, right? So I mean, it's a little bit of a different thing. The call reluctant caller. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I really want to avoid that, right? What is that? Yes, that's great. So, uh, well, so what you can do in the interview process is ask them about their experience, drill down into some of their answers, and they give you an interesting answer, right? If they did cold calling in the past, great. Tell me more about that. What did you do, right? Because it's usually not for real estate. Real estate is such a small part of the industry when you're talking about call centers. But, but tell, ask them about their relevant experience. What did you do in a cold calling role? Or if they, or if they grew, did appointment setting, great. What did you do in that role? What was hard about it? What did you like about it, right? The goal is to get them talking. That's it. Just get them talking. Get them talking about themselves, about their role, about their experience. And you want to do this as much as you can. Always ask the same set questions to the candidate. And of course, those drill down follow-up questions might be a little bit different. But you want to at least be able to compare apples to apples. People can make this mistake of just having completely different conversations with folks. And then how do you compare uh, one versus the other. It can be hard, right? So understand that. You want As much as you can, you want to compare apples to apples. Keep the base questions consistent and only do variations when they say something interesting. You can drill down around that, right? So that's what the interview is really, really good for, but there's limitations to that, okay? So I'm going to rock through this. We've got a few minutes left, so let's rock through this next one. Next, yep. step, happy. so you, you interview, you select the great person with the understanding that the final part of the interview 
is coming next. And this is the onboarding process, okay? Onboarding, this is where you, your ISA joins your team, right? This is their first day on the job. This is the first week. We call this the first 30 days, okay? And this is where that SOP we talked about before, it comes, it comes in handy. This is like a lifesaver in this stage because that's one of the first things you give your ISA. Hey, this is going to tell you in a really simple way, going to tell you what your job is, right? This is what I want you to do in a nutshell. There you go. Got to get all their tools ready. Dialers, got to get, you know, the CRM seat, everything they need to do the job. Got to help them set this up. Tristan, the first day or two is just getting them set up with everything they need to do the job, right? Like yeah. that takes up the full first full day, if not the first couple of days, and take, if it's more complicated, right? You want to present them their first script. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Give them one script to start off with. I don't want to see five different scripts. They're not going to learn five scripts right away. No, Give them the they're not even going to learn one. They're, they're just not probably going to learn one, right? You want to go through it, get them ready. And within the first, I'd say two to three days, the priority is to get them on the phone. That's it for the ISA. That's it. Second day, third day at the latest, you want to get them set up and making those first calls. They're not going to be a master of the script yet. Nope. They're not going to be a master of your like general geographic area yet. Also true. Okay. But you want to get them on the phone because you want to find out, right? How quickly they can get on there. Do we have any issues getting on there? And how quickly can they overcome the challenges they're going to face? They're not, they're going to be terrible when they start. This is normal. This is par for the course, right? They're going to be terrible, but you're going to give them that feedback and you want them to see rapid improvement. That's the, the biggest indicator of success in this role at this stage is not how awesome they are on their first try. No, that's actually not a great indicator. Yeah, it is terrible. We, this, yeah, exactly. Right. They might be good at interviewing. They might, they might be really good at role play, right? Yes, They're good at memorizing. It before. 100%. Can we, I just want to add something really quick. Go for it. Is when you're looking to hire an ISA or, or, or VA admin, anything, I want you to look at this very long term because the, the return on your investment on, on a hire is really going to depend on the evolution of the person that you hire in the time that you put into what they become. Uh, and it takes time. If you're going in and saying, hey, I'm going to test this for three months and see how it works, you know what? Don't even try it. That's not, it's not going to work. If you're looking at this and saying, I'm going to give this a shot for a year, but I'm going to put effort into it to help them grow into what I want them to become, that's different because now you're looking a little bit more long-term yeah. Right. What I would even look and, and challenge you and say, when you take on something like this, you know, as long as you continually change and adapt, look at this as a as a lifelong process. You will always need an ISA, somebody that's going to make calls for you and, and reach out to people and nurture them and love them and create relationships. It's gonna it's a forever thing. So exactly. when you add this, you're always going to be shifting towards what this person is better at. Are they better at incoming calls? Are they better at making those calls that you want them for expired and for sale by owners or online leads? What, what does it look like? But you can't get there unless you have that mindset. And a lot of us don't. So that's what sure. I want to know. 100%. And if, you, and if you think longer term, you make better decisions, in my opinion. You, you, make, you make different decisions and if you're short-term focused, if you're long-term focused, you're going to have this role in your team for forever. And it might not be the same person doing it, granted, right? Yep. But you're going to have that role on your team for forever. So think, and that's a great way to think about it, Tristan. So like I said, in this stage, you're getting them in there, getting them on the phone, because what you really want to get into is that training part, right? And that training part is so important, especially those first 30 days, one to two hours per day. There's no way around this, folks, right? You got to make peace with the fact that your ISA needs your time. And this isn't, this isn't regardless whether you, you go with Power ISA or not. It doesn't matter, right? This is the same amount of work that it takes to train them on the, the way you want things to be done. And you want to make sure that you're listening to those calls and answering their questions on a daily basis. This is where the magic happens. There's no shortcut to this, right? This is what you control the most. The time you make 
to be with that ISA and get them to the level that you want to be, okay? You never want to leave your new ISA alone. Like, oh yeah, you know what? I'm too busy. I got to go close deals. I got to go attend appointments. Your ISA needs you, right? Every hour spent is like a $10,000 an hour activity. That's the way I see it, right? To get them up and, and going. They're going to be terrible at first, but the biggest indicator, like I mentioned, is how quickly they correct those mistakes. That is the game, okay? It's not how good they do off the bat. Some people can confuse with that, right? The polish is good. I don't care about polish. It is how coachable, how trainable are they? That's it. That's the game. That's the most important piece. So I'm going to, last slide here real quick because we're pretty much out of time. But when it comes to bonuses and compensation, folks, ISAs are salespeople. They want bonuses, okay? Now, in some parts, you can bonus people on closed transactions. In some parts, that's kind of problematic. Talk mm -hmm. to your broker, right? Compliance, right? Be compliant. But I prefer bonusing on the activities the ISAs control the most, which is actually not closed transactions. They, they don't have a ton of control over that, honestly, right? Mm -hmm. They have the most control over how many calls are they making? Are they following that script? And are they handling those objections the right way? If we're talking about cold calling, it's qualified seller leads in the pipeline every week. If we're talking about inbound leads, it is attended appointments, okay? How many of those are they generating on a weekly basis? And if they hit that goal, they get that bonus. If they hit that goal every week, it's called a raise. That's not the right goal. Your goal is too easy. It has to be challenging. And my goal is to make sure they're hitting their goals once to twice a month. That's normal. If your goal is challenging, right? This is an actually a good performance goal. So that's generally what I recommend people should bonus their ISAs on. The activities, the ISAs control the most, okay? Not that you can't bonus on other activities, but mm. this is the ones that are the most important and they're going to lead you to more success, okay? I agree. Great. 100%. So last thing, last thing. I have a freebie. I have a free giveaway for the folks that made it all the way to this part of the presentation. Folks, we have a free monthly performance tracker. This tracks the metrics that we use to judge great ISAs, which are really simple. Phone calls, contacts, and conversions. I can tell pretty much anything about any ISA by looking at those three numbers over a 30-day period. I can tell, is your ISA any good? Are they good? Are they bad? Are they, are they average? I can usually tell it by just looking at those numbers for pretty much any campaign. So you get a free monthly performance tracker with those numbers, right? With that, uh, uh, like convert, you can automatically calculate the conversion rate by using this, uh, this, this data sheet. Yeah. On this, uh, can you, do you have a landing page for this or no? No, watch it. You got to send an email and they'll get like an automatic response for this. We probably should set up a landing page you know what? for this. I'm, I'm thinking this. This is what I'm thinking. Because because I I can, I think we can do this on the Lab Code Agents page. Oh, if I love we could that. be like free ISA tracker, love it. Just do us a favor and go click on this link or or text us this information, right? Love I it. just don't want to do it because then I'll capture all of the all of the lead. <laughs> we'll do, we'll do. Hundred percent. I love that, right? So yeah, we'll, we'll do that too. This is the basic one, right? You can just email info power ISA. Make sure you include free ISA tracker exactly like you're seeing it here on this on this slide, right? Put that in the subject and we'll send it over to you. But uh, Christian, I'm going to take that. I'm going to run with that too. We'll have more options for this. I mean, drop it in the description below if you're watching this on YouTube later. But, but for the folks watching this live, send an email right there and, and we'll set up the automation a little bit later today, but we'll send this over to you. Um, and that's a freebie for watching all the way here uh, to this part of the presentation. That is it, folks. That's what I got. Uh, you know, Tristan and everyone, thank you so much uh, for jumping here. Really appreciate you guys. Don't don't leave yet. I'm right. I'm actually typing this in right now. So okay. hold on. damn it. Power info at powerisa.com with free ISA tracker in the subject line. Got it. With yes, yes. Free ISA tracker. Free, free ISA tracker. ISA track tracker. Yes. Free ISA, ISA tracker subject line and you'll get an automated response perfect hold on 
Yeah. So we're, I don't think we've turned it on yet, but you'll get a response today. And then everyone else will get the, the automated one uh, once we turn this on. Right. I was going to be turning it on right after the presentation. So there you go. Perfect. I'm going to let's give this a shot on lab codes right now. I'm going Love to it. post it up right now. Everyone, thank you so much for for joining. Is there an example of SOP for anybody? Um, you know what? We can, uh, Gus, if you want to give an example of an SOP in lab code agents, like a, a shot, we'll, we'll put that up there as well. Gregory, that's a great question. And it's, it's a good one. Valuable. That should be so, the next giveaway we do, like a free SOP. <laughs> you know the what? On the Gus, next one. Every week, like, Seriously. what's the next giveaway? Like, Gus 100%. is, is going to be known for his giveaways. Yeah, freebie. You get an SOP. You get an SOP. Everybody gets an SOP. <laughs> that right. sounds like a bad word at that point. Yeah. <laughs> USOP. USOP. There you go. I uh, love it, Gus. Thank you so much, buddy. All right, man. Appreciate you. Thanks, everybody.